to the morning show right here on the Rise News channel. Nigeria is hopeful of signing a $2 million renewable energy deal with the United Nations Environment Program. This much was revealed during a news conference organized by the Office of the National Council on Climate Change held at the Nigerian Pavilion at COP29 holding in Baku, Azerbaijan. A RISE correspondent, Ovitimi George, has the report. It's yet another conference of parties as nations converge on Baku, Azerbaijan for intense discussions on the need to face out fossil fuels in the ongoing narrative about climate change. Developing countries such as Nigeria are hoping for big commitments from rich industrialized nations as contributors to global warming and producers of fossil fuels. The Director General of the National Council on Climate Change is optimistic of favorable outcomes. One of the things we have done uh, differently is that for the very first time, we trained negotiators from the subnationals. And that was to be able to ensure that the voice of the subnationals are heard. We've brought them to ensure that there's a representation of the 36 states of Nigeria and the FCT in all the negotiating uh, agenda items. Because at the end of the day, these are the people that will come back to the communities and ensure that they, they have that interaction. As a country, uh, we're going to sit down again with the subnationals and to further um, map out what are our um, strategies to further enhance communications with the local government. Drawing strength from Article 6 of the 2015 Paris Agreement, Nigeria is positive that improved financial support will help to tackle climate change. We're about to sign a $2 million you know, uh, renewable energy you know, deal with UNEP, United Nations Environment Program. So that's something. And um, you know, our message here in COP, it's very simple. Enough of the pledges. We want to see real action. Last year COP, we had about $1.5 trillion pledges, but only 2% of that pledge came to Africa. And I'm not sure if we have even 1% or 0.5% in Nigeria. So what we are saying here is, since they have designated this COP to be a finance COP, then what are we taking home with? There has been submission by the African group that we have made to the WIM, the Warsaw um, mechanism. So we are still looking forward for the negotiations. We are expecting to have the African groups a position on the submissions that we are anticipating to submit. And then we are also looking at um, how it is going to, of course, um, be useful to Nigeria. Article 6 also allows countries to transfer carbon credits earned from the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to help other countries to meet their climate targets. From Baku, Azerbaijan, Ophiyeteme George, Arise News. So joining us now from Baku, Azerbaijan, is uh, Limo Basi, Executive Director of uh, Health of um, uh, Mother Earth Foundation. Great to have you, Limo. Uh, the conversations, yes, we normally have all these Thank conversations you. every year at COP, but some nations are very bullish. Take, for instance, Alayev, <laughs> the president of um, Azerbaijan, did say, this is our gift from nature, so you can't tell us how to run our lives. As long as you have people still saying that, are we ever going to make any headway on protecting our environment? Well, this is the challenge of the Conference of Parties because everything that we're seeing uh, is a play, is kind of a scenario of display of geopolitical power. And so every nation here is negotiating on its own national interest, which is problematic because climate change is a global problem. That's why it's called global warming, better called global burning. But for nations to come together and then insist on private interest, that is really a big problem. And this particular COP has been tagged a uh, finance COP, but you know, that is just a label. Because if you trace the history of the COPs and how financial pledges have been made and delivered, you'll find that a whole lot of it is hot air. In 20, 2009, there was a pledge that from 2020, the Global North will contribute about 100 
billion dollars to the countries that are vulnerable and impacted adversely by climate change without having contributed to it. But until last year, that figure was never achieved. And when it was achieved, it was mostly as loans, not really as grants, which means putting more burden, economic burden, on poor countries. Right. Well, having said that, like you, you correctly said, this has been tagged the finance cop. How is that looking for Africa? We already know that countries like Argentina have withdrawn. Uh, so, and I believe Nigeria, however, is uh, finalizing a number of deals. So can you let us know how the finance part of this COP is going for the Nigerian delegation? OK, uh, but generally, let me just say that coming to the COP for financial deal is a bad strategy, because this should be an avenue for negotiations to hold the polluters accountable not to seek loans or grants or projects, not really. This is a negotiation on principles and demanding for the highest uh, accountability and responsibility by those who have brought the world into this crisis. And so calling the COP a finance COP, and how will it play out? Of course, Nigeria is already, we've heard the report, uh, you, you heard the report of the agreement MOU also by with United Nations Environment Program for $2 million. You know, that is just a trickle. If the Naira had the value it ought to have, $2 million would just be something that would just maybe take care of a, a small neighborhood in terms of energy provision. And so I, it's very doubtful if at the end of the day, anybody would say this was a milestone cup because we talked about finance. In fact, the first day of the cup, there was the opening of the gateway for carbon credits and carbon trading thereby presenting this COP possibly as one of the major milestones where market environmentalism took the high, high ground. And that is problematic because it's going to mean nations like Nigeria fighting to seed territories for carbon trading and whoever invests in making, taking up those territories would now count that as their own climate action. Nigeria would not count it because whoever pays for the carbon I'm using a, a language that makes it easy for everyone to follow. Whoever now owns the carbon in the trees in a particular forest in Nigeria would count that forest as their own carbon sinks. And so you're finding, in a sense, a, an arrival at a certain level of carbon colonialism or carbon slavery for the communities who would be watchmen of the carbon in trees. Okay, Nibo, let's talk about even Nigeria's leadership as regards climate change issues. Because... The person that is supposed to be leading that position is no longer there. I'm talking about a jury. And when a jury was still in government, he was supposed to be leading our climate ch charge. What's going on as regards our climate leadership? That's the first question. The second question I want to ask you will be about Ken Sarawiwa. This was what Ken Sarawiwa was fighting for all this while. As regards, you know, better life for the people of Ogoni with the Ogoni Bill of Rights and all of that. But now that the pre, pre, this incumbent President Tinubu has appreciated that fight of some sort, where will you say we are as regards this remediation and you're going to clean up and all of that work? Well, thank you. Those are two very big questions. Uh, you know, let me, let me take the Ogodi case first. Uh, now, Ken Sarawiwa was a prophet. He foresaw the future. Of course, he lived the experience of his own time. And all the complaints he made and everything in the Ogoni Bill of Rights still stand as key demands of the Ogoni people. In fact, the Ogoni Bill of Rights has not been addressed sufficiently by any government, and which is a sad thing because that bill was submitted in 1990 to the federal government. Now, the cleanup is going on and it's slow, of course, but then Ogoni land is the, one of the worst pol polluted places on earth. And so we don't expect that there's somewhere else to have it to learn from. Exxon Valdez oil spill occurred in Alaska in 1989. There were thousands of experts working to clean it up, and they did clean it up. But as we speak today, the effect of that oil spill of 1989 is still being felt because all the species that were lost by this, to the spill have not returned to that place. They have not recovered at the level they used to be. And so with the Ogoni situation, the pollution that has gone on for years, and in fact, the, the larger Niger Delta, with continuous pollution going on without any redress, we have a very big problem on our hand. 
Uh, so Ogoni, the high prep is a learning to me is conducting a laboratory and that's why i'm happy they, they are building the center of excellence which will develop and grow skills that could be extended to clean up and study the other parts of the niger delta and so the recognition recognition of the government that cancer we and the other eight leaders were wrongfully executed is a very good starting point but what we expect the president to do is to completely exonerate them and we expect him to also say we're going to consider and implement the Ogoni Bill of Rights. I also would like to mention that this, there was a sculpture, it's a boss that was sent, donated to Nigeria, to the Ogoni people uh, from Europe by a Nigerian artist. He uh, called it the, the boss, Sarawiwa boss. He's been arrested and detained by the Nigerian custom for years now without any just reason. If the president pardons if uh, recognizes to honor those who were executed in 1995, they should also uh, release that sculpture. Because the sculpture, having a sculpture, a memory of those who were wrongfully executed cannot be an offense. So the Nigerian cousin should be held to account for that and they should produce that equipment. Now back to the COP. Well, here we are and, you know, uh, the COP provides a lot of opportunities. And today, if I, around the COP, the Global South and even the Group of 77 are demanding for a payment of, a, of climate finance of, one, of, of $1.3 trillion to start with. In fact, the demand by civil society is $5 trillion every year to compensate for the damage suffered by the Global South from climate impacts. Scientists have estimated $6 trillion. And the problem it will be, where is that money going to come from? The COP is sending the signal that a lot of the money will come from innovative financial instruments and from the private sector. Now, when you talk about innovative, innovative instruments and private sector, we are talking about profit. And if that money is tied to profit, then it's going to actually be a big burden. And so community people are asking for grants. They're asking for reparation. They're asking for recognition that the climate debt that is being owed the people or in the vulnerable poor nations. Okay, okay, Mr. And that's what we want to hear from the COP. Mr. That's what Nigeria should push for. Mr. Bassi, so we are in COP. Since Ajuri and Galali left, no climate leadership of some sort. Or can you correct me if I'm oh. wrong? Maybe somebody has replaced him because you're in the ecosystem. Can right. you correct me? <laughs> right. No, no, you are very correct. You know, the, I think the management of climate change in Nigeria has been very tumultuous. Uh, we had the climate, we, had, we just woke up, woke up one day and saw that uh, there was a climate envoy. Now there's no climate envoy. Having a climate envoy is something that needs to be considered, needs to be considered very carefully. Because the climate envoy will be the leader of the Nigerian delegation when it comes to negotiation. But right now, the climate envoy resigned, maybe for family or health reasons, and there's not been a word about what happens to that office. And he made a lot of pronouncements in the few weeks or months that he was in office, which we need clarification on, including, including the, the evergreen city that he proposed for somewhere in Abuja. That appeared to be an enclave of exception that will operate outside the laws of this land in terms of plan approval, in terms of EIA, and so on and so forth. So we need to know who is, who is in charge. But now it looks like, it, it does look like he's a DG of the NCCC. Otherwise, he would have been the Minister for Environment. We don't really know. And, you know, still in the same breath, you know, because it all comes down to accountability, doesn't it? Uh, my question is, how do you advise Nigerians to hold the government accountable for whatever deals are reached or whatever, you know, agenda is set? Uh, because there's a disconnect at the moment. You ask most people what has been happening with the Nigeria's delegation at, uh, COP, at COP summits in past years. Most people only know that Nigeria takes a very big delegation. Most people don't know the key takeaways uh, that Nigeria uh, engages in and benefits from, from, from these summits. So with regards to COP29, what parameters do you think Nigerians can use to hold the government accountable uh, for working towards, um, you know, working towards alleviating climate change, the impact of climate change to Nigeria? Uh, thank you for that question. How do we hold the government accountable for uh, what we see as outcome of the COP? 
I, I think we have to look at that from the overall framework of the Conference of Parties itself, of the United Nations Environment uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, one thing I believe the not, not, usually it's not easy for governments to speak of environmental climate justice, but that is the basis of the whole negotiation. Even though now that is shifting more to voluntarism and to private finance. So in terms of the basic framework of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, what Nigerians can do is to ask the government. We know that all these negotiations and finance and action should be on what is termed the common but differentiated responsibilities, which means the countries who have done the most to create the problem should do the most also to solve the problem. So they should ask the question, what are the contributions? It's not a question of Nigeria or other countries saying, okay, we're going to cut emissions at this level. That is good. But for Africa that has contributed, contributed less than 3% of the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, cutting emissions or not emitting is actually insignificant because the big polluters are still releasing more carbon into the atmosphere. So what is the government doing to hold them accountable? And then we can now hold our government accountable for what they say they're doing to hold the polluters accountable. But we have a big problem because we still have, as we all know, basic things that ought to be done is not being done in Nigeria, mm. stopping gas flaring. So I think we should look at our own local context and hold our, account, our government, accountable, our government accountable for gas flaring, for floods that happen due to poor infrastructural management for lack of adherence to planning policies in terms of flood prone areas. We have to ask our government, what are you doing to coastal communities who are being washed away into the oceans? Let's look at the local reality and hold our government accountable to that before we even ask what they're doing at the global environment. Okay, so a couple of things. How is all of this going to play out in a Trump presidency and a Trump economy? Somebody that doesn't believe climate change uh, in the conversations on climate change that thinks it's a, it's a hoax, that doesn't believe it's real, how are we going to navigate through an America that might be isolationist when a Trump comes in, that might not be a party to most of this climate change conversation, owing to the fact that realistically when you look at it, the first people to make a lot of noise as regards this climate change conversation was Al Gore when he did that famous doc documentary, The Inconvenient Truth, the former vice president of America. But America with Trump, you know how it goes. That's number one. Number two will be, I can see some of the campaigners at the, at the back there talking about, you know, the initial payments of the $1.5 to be able to remediate the situation. The thing is, you said, where are we going to get the money from? The American military spends over $1 trillion every year on the military alone. So these heavy polluters can actually do justice to the climate change conversation. But it's a north and south divide. They feel smaller nations like us should not industrialize, we should go and die, while they take all the perks of industrialization. Is it a fair world to live in, really? Not at all. The world is very unjust. We see running a colonial, distorted system of politics across the world. And it's very sad. You know, the, as you said, America spends a whole lot of money manufacturing bombs and deploying them to destroy places where we should be building resilience. In fact, the global north spends about $2.4 trillion a year in military, uh, in military armament and warfare. So the question of finance for climate change is not a problem. It's just an issue of choice by those who want to profit from destruction profit by uh, having military power and, and all that. That is the problem. And now with the new president of the U.S. coming to office in January 2025, that is a great problem for the multilateral system of tackling global warming. Now, a couple of days back, Argentina also pulled out. Argentina is led by somebody who has the same alignment with the incoming president of the United States. So if Argentina pulls out, uh, United States pulls out the Paris Agreement eventually and others uh, a few other countries joining, that is a destruction of the cooperation that we've seen in the world beginning to emerge to tackle global warming. It's going to, it may end up every man to himself and then we look for how to survive the flood that is coming and the fires and the, and the droughts that are coming. It's truly incredible 
that anybody would think that global warming is not real. It's simply unbelievable. And I think it's just because people think, think about profit and not people or planet. It is very sad commentary. And so everyone has to start now. I think in Africa, we have to work more as Pan-Africanists, take, take, take stock of what is coming and plan how to withstand the crisis. We can't do it alone, unfortunately. We, we simply... We simply can't do it alone. Uh, Nimo Bassi, thank you so much uh, for that insight and enjoy your, the rest of your time in Azerbaijan.